Hello and welcome to Curated Spaces, the podcast that explores the stories behind spaces reimagining how we stay, work and play. Join me, Molly Cooper, as I sit down with founders, owners and thought leaders to hear about their journey of bringing a space to life. Great spaces shape our lives. They inspire, nurture and connect us. But most importantly, they bring us together to share life's milestones with the people who mean the most to us. So whether you're a traveller, foodie or design seeker, join us as we celebrate the power of spaces and the brilliant people behind them. Today I'm in West London in Hammersmith at a beautiful Grey 2 listed mansion that has been beautifully renovated into an open house called Kindred. Community and connection are at the heart of this space with co-working, live events and exceptional food and drink all designed to bring people together. I'm so excited to welcome Anna Anderson, Kindred's founder, to the podcast. I can't wait to hear all about bringing a space to life with such a strong set of values at its core. Anna, welcome to Curator Spaces. How are you doing today? Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm doing very well. Um, yeah, it's been a really busy period, just been really good and the team are working really hard, uh, but the energy's great. And I personally, this is like my favorite season, so. Me too, <laughs> I love it. I love a transitional season. When you get those first few crisp days, the sweaters exactly. come out. Yeah, I'm here for it. Okay, well, before we get into the space, I'd love to hear a bit about you and your background and what you were up to before you brought Kindred to life. Yeah, so I um, I came to Kindred from, yeah, as you say, a slightly weird route. I was a social worker before. Um, so I was practicing for about three years in London after I qualified, um, working across a range of different issues, um, often recurring issues, domestic violence, mental health issues, alcohol, drug abuse. Yeah, all sorts of all sorts of things. Um, it was super interesting. I actually really enjoyed the work. Um, it was very individualistic though it was sort of you know you're working with one family then one family and one family and it's and you're dealing with the same issues and recurring issues so um that was where i got really interested in thinking about community approaches and what could we be doing from a community level that could be mitigating some of these problems before they kind of become crisis um and that's sort of how i made the segue into building a community space was through that intrigue and that passion so i love it okay and i've already got so much I want to talk to you about on that but before we get carried away let's start by setting a bit of a scene here for people listening in like I said we're in Hammersmith a really buzzing part of London can you help paint a bit of a picture for people who maybe haven't been here before yeah so Hammersmith is a super interesting place to be um it's uh it's got a lot of soul a lot of spirit um it's gritty um there's still you know that feeling of like old London um you know kind of intention with the new as well and and you're sort of feeling that every day but there are you know there are residents here who've lived here for 30 years and that's sort of that history and that sort of uh that community is really really strong here too so you kind of have this really lovely metropolis of a yeah. of an experience living in Hammersmith um and uh we're sort of plonked in the middle of the busiest roundabout in yeah. London I think and the busiest tube station in London as well which is which is you know a curse and a blessing I would say yeah, here come the sirens thank you thank you Hammersmith <laughs> exactly um and yeah I think it really has that that spirit like you say that that grit and spark of like London as a real working living city um and I really love it whenever I come out here there's that bustle which you just yeah really really love it um so yeah let's get into it we kind of spoke about it then we're plonked here right opposite the tube station <laughs> and this building is incredible it has these amazing windows that sweeping staircase up to the front door can you tell us a bit about the building itself and the history behind it yeah so i mean this building is extraordinary it's um we, well we found it uh, and it had been neglected for a really long time you know yeah. for 30 40 years and the landlord was kind of, sort of desperately trying to find someone who had the vision and the idea and then I think the deep pockets to, to bring it back to life to be honest and um, you know I was I was not a West London girl so I I was in Greenwich at the time and, and mm. Bermondsey before that so I'd I'd never really knew that Hammersmith really existed it was sort of where we drove through to get yeah. to, to the airport um, but this building sort of hides in plain sight and 
it's it's it sort of really spoke to us when we when we first found it. Um, it was super neglected, very run down. An occupant was in there, but they hadn't invested anything in it. They boarded up the windows. Mm. It was painted this lurid green color. It was it was very interesting, and you had to really imagine what it could be. And we did, you know. And it was it, it was um, it was fun and. We wanted to bring it back to life while retaining the old and retaining the history mm-hmm. and just stripping back and revealing everything that yeah. the building was. Originally, Bradmore House was, uh, you know, a 1700s uh, building. It was an annex mm-hmm. uh, built by the Lord of um, Butterwick House, which was long since destroyed uh. Manor House in Hammersmith. And he built this annex for um, this woman, this leading actress of the day, oh, Miss oh. Anne Oldfield, yes, who was his mistress. And she wasn't allowed in his house, so, she, <laughs> so he built her her own house Um, and apparently Miss Anne Oldfield had several of these annexes up and down the country it was kind of her thing and she's a bit of a legend and um, we actually have a portrait of her that we had commissioned um, painted in its upstairs in the in a salon bar so it's a really nice way to just like bring the building back to life and um, celebrate its history oh I love that sounds like Anne was doing all right for herself wasn't she (laughs) yeah Yeah. she knew what she was doing So you find this amazing building, you see past the plasterboard and the bright green paint. Did you immediately think, yes, it's going to be, you know, dark walls, it's going to be gold bars, or was it very much a process of like learning about the space and letting it sort of open up to you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely can't take credit for um, how Kindred looks too much. I think I did choose the colour of the walls, so I am to go, I'm going to take that one. But yes. the majority of it, you know, it's learning from the people that know this stuff. So your architects and your designers and and people who work in hospitality and understand like how a space works and and you know I would love to deck it out with X but it's like no Anna someone's gonna spill something on it you know you've got to be realistic you know mm. got everything fireproof so I've learned a huge amount as we've gone um but I've also you know I've also learned that you don't have to make everything look like everything else yeah. that already exists and what we wanted to do we didn't want it to be Soho House. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention other businesses yeah, on this, but <laughs> we didn't want it to look like Soho House. We didn't want it to look like a co-working mm. space. We wanted it to look like someone's home, and mm. but with character and sort of a luxe feel without being too pretentious, mm. being cosy, without being like slovenly, you know. You, yeah. know, you want it to kind of do a lot of things as well you, the building really has to work hard for itself so we've got to move the furniture we've got to think about how we're going to change from day to night you know mm. it's it's a lot of different things to think about and I've learned a huge amount from the amazing professionals that you know yeah. have all been involved you know yeah oh absolutely and I know there's a very strong concept at the heart of the space which actually is really cleverly reflected in how it's set up but could you maybe tell us a bit about the whole kindred campfire um, thing that's at the heart of this space. Yeah, um, yeah. So the the reason why we opened Kindred was to sort of address this need that, for me, was kind of not really spoken about at that time. This was, you know, a couple of years before COVID, um, and no one was really talking about loneliness mm. in cities. It was sort of a shameful thing. Um, people were embarrassed to admit that they were lonely. It was sort of considered that old people are lonely, but young people, if you were lonely, there's something wrong with you, you know. Mm. And um, but I kind of. I think, you know, my experience in social work sort of told me that, you know, loneliness does not discriminate. It touches everybody, whether you have family and friends or not. And um, we wanted to create a space that really addressed that and actually Mm -hmm. proactively enabled adults to be able to meet each other and make friendships and connections. And and we do that in very simple ways. Um, You know, Campfire is the heart of, you know, our ethos, this idea that human beings have always gathered around the fire to talk and to connect and to build bonds, you know, and Mm -hmm. um, we have a fire in the building, um, (laughs) a a fireplace, which is lovely, but we also kind of have these campfire events that we, well, we call them campfire events because they are about bringing people together Mm -hmm. and they're very simple events, but they are effective. Um, So we have our coffee morning um, every day. So people who co-work with us, Uh they can just meet each other for half an hour and just chat about their day and what their goals are. Um, We have, you know, thank Thank Friday. It's like, thank something. It's Friday. I can't remember what, whether it's something rude. I, don't, I can't remember. But uh, um, um, thank five. It's Friday. That's the one. That's, this is not rude. Thank God. Um, it's where people gather in the bar downstairs and just have a drink. And the first drinks on us. And it's just about like Aww. creating these moments where you can actually like make friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's 
it is that simple it like yeah. london is better when you know people and um that's what we want to do yeah yeah and you know living in london is fab but everyone gets lonely or you just find yourself sitting at home especially now with work from anywhere and going to the office less and i think covid really sort of exposed that in people's lives when people were dependent on that nine to five in the office, you saw all your people there and then you just relaxed at home. And with that taken away, I think a lot of people struggle to adapt to this new world. And to me, spaces like this are just so important for giving people that connection to something bigger than themselves, to get out of the flat and to meet new people who they wouldn't have met otherwise, which is, you know, weirdly quite hard to do in a huge, in a huge city, <laughs> you know, which feels strange. Yeah. Yeah. And as we look around, I mean, like you walk in and there's a the sofa's right in front of you, there's all the chairs. It feels like everything here was designed to get people together, to get them talking. This isn't a place where you come and get a drink and just sit by yourself, you know, this is somewhere where you come and meet people. Um, I'd love to hear a bit about the people who do come here and how they use the space and what you found there. Yeah, um, lots of different people use the space. And what I think, you know, what we found is that we've tried really hard to do the classic marketing strategy of being like, right, Kindred is for X. Yeah. And we got to target these people People. And, and we tried doing that and it didn't work for us. And I think the reason is because Kindred is a lot of different things, but for a lot of different people, mm. for different reasons. Um, <laughs> so, you know, our co-workers are going to be generally people that live really locally, that want somewhere to come, that isn't home, isn't mm. an office, isn't Starbucks. You know, they yeah. want somewhere that, that has a little bit of something, but isn't too expensive, is flexible, has community. That's one group. You know, mm. then we have the people that come to Cellar, to our restaurant downstairs, mm. you know, different group again. And then the people that come to our events, they're coming from further afield they're traveling to see the musician they like or the speaker they like mm. um, and they're also you know as much as anybody they're looking for connection in those moments find people who are excited about the same things they're excited about so we find that the space and the community kind of works together and it's an evolving it's an evolving beast kindred yeah. you know we've we've reinvented ourselves a few different times trying to listen to what people need us to be and what you know what we're good at and what people like us mm. for and that's kind of part of the joy i think of building a space is allowing for that growth and that journey yeah um yeah yeah and i think the best spaces do do that they they let people come together and then they learn from what those people get up to and then they constantly adapt to encourage all the great things that come from when humans just like sit down and chat. And I know you have your three pillars, which I'd love to go into now. Um, is it food, music and looking ahead? So yeah. tell me all about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So yeah, we have an events program um, that we curate uh, and that, yeah, like you say, that that covers over three three key pillars. Um, so our sort of the, the dominant one that kind of features most strongly in the, in the program is our live music and performance. Mm. So we're very passionate about um, a really good night out <laughs> and because, you know, it, it builds friendships, are. exactly. Yeah. And but also showcasing really great talent, sort of often undiscovered um, and just allowing space for just art to kind of breathe and mm. be what art should be, which is, yeah. you know, um, a direct experience between performer and audience. Um, mm. So we're very passionate about that and the space kind of designed for that. Um, yeah, and then we also, you know, in that category as well, we have our spoken word and our poetry as well, and that's sort mm. of a, a lovely, a lovely thing that happens. Um, food and drink events for sure. Yeah. So that's like um, our, you know, whiskey tastings and cocktail making mm. and wine and cheese nights and um, and you know book launches uh, with new sort of um, you know, food writers and that kind yeah. of thing. And um, the piece of the calendar that's very close to my heart is the um, ideas for a better tomorrow, nice. and that's our, you know, our speaker events and our work shops and um, anything that you know any networking events where it's like bringing people you know who would otherwise be sort of working on their own mm. enabling them to have that spark with someone that could you know make a new idea and think yeah more about the solutions rather than the problems you know find optimism for the future rather than despair you know mm. it's it's all of that stuff and i think these spaces are so brilliant at doing that because you get such a mix of people you know this isn't one company where everyone's got that shared Know, corporate agenda it's not just creative people it's this real mix of people from all walks of life mm. and they come with their own ideas and i know what was it the name of that the event you run ideate was it yeah that's right oh, yeah so. tell me about ideate because i love it <laughs> oh thank you ideate is um a signature event that we created um i guess like a year and a half ago yeah. um and it was it was born out of a desire to kind of showcase some of the cool things that were happening mm. locally uh we've expanded it to broader london um and it's it's about, you know, eight speakers have eight minutes to deliver an idea that could change yeah. the world. And we find that it's um, 
people really respond to that event because it's really wide ranging. There's no special like spe specialism needed to mm -hmm. listen to these talks. You don't have to be an expert in X, Y, Z. You can just come and enjoy. And we find that the, just the the act of listening to these speakers who are all doing amazing things in different mm -hmm. fields, um, the the audience then has their own conversations about what they're working on, and yeah. you create these moments of connection in that yeah. in that event as well, which is great. And such a nice way, a very like approachable, easy way to facilitate these big conversations that need to be have, had around big, but quite scary topics. Mm. And actually, I think especially now people can be a bit scared to talk their minds sometimes or cancel culture and actually getting people in a room and just discussing mm. is so important. Yeah, I really agree with that. And I think, I mean, Kindred is all about the in-person connection. I mean, we're very good as, as a society at connecting online. I think mm -hmm. we've worked really hard on that. Um, but I do think it doesn't quite, it isn't the same. And there's a lot of evidence now to say that you know, loneliness, disconnection actually is harmful to our physical health. Uh, we're living longer when we're able to see people in person more often. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of there's a lot of people kind of really interested in this now. And so we are, you know, we we get the value of online conversation and connection, but I don't think there's anything quite like being in a room with people, mm -hmm. looking them in the eye, putting your phone away yeah. and just talking and imagining. And I think that that's something that we try and champion. Um, it's just good for us. Yeah, and I think we are at such an interesting shift where people are finally being like, I actually don't want to do everything on my phone. I don't want to have an app for everything. Mm. I actually want to put it down, like you say, live in the real world, see people in person. I mm. want to try and do a, a digital detox for a weekend and mm. really get the value. And like you say, so many scientists and doctors are now saying, you want to live a long life, get out there and see your friends. You know, That's it. our relationships are the most important thing to us. And I think most people like, wouldn't disagree with that, would they? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I definitely wouldn't disagree. <laughs> I've built a business on it, so I'm hoping that's right. I'm hoping that's right. Exactly. Well, let's talk about food and drink then, because mm. I know Dan and Stella, very cosy, warm space. It's lovely, like velvet banquets. <laughs> um, tell me about the food and the drink that you have throughout the house here. Yeah, so um, we're very passionate about uh, using local suppliers. Mm. We know all of our suppliers by name. Um, they are often hardworking individual artisan people who... Um, yeah, work really hard to to preserve the planet as well as like look after their staff. So we're we're trying really hard to participate in a much more ethical kind of web of of um, you know of food food and drink suppliers than than we might have if we hadn't thought about it. <laughs> um, and so yeah, and then what that looks like on our menu, um, we change it seasonally. Um, that's yeah. across our food and our drinks. Um, so we're always trying to kind of showcase really beautiful um, local, if possible, mm. ingredients, um, but also just creating food that people just really want to eat. You yeah. know, like I just think so often you go to a restaurant and there's like a lot of beautiful things. But you're like, I just don't, I, I'm not yeah. connecting. So we we do really like hearty food as well as healthy, mm. and we find that that that, that just works. Um, and then our you know our drinks we're very proud of. We work hard to create these beautiful cocktails. I have mm. to say I'm not a cocktail person. Or I wasn't a cocktail person until I started working. <laughs> Industry. Um, but then, you know, the, the team work really, really hard on them and they are stunning. And the um, and the wines as well, all natural, organic, you know, sourced from lo uh, sort of smaller producers, husband and wife teams in Central and, East, um, Central and Eastern Europe. And um, yeah, we're, we're really proud of, of the quality of the food and drink here. Mm -hmm. And again, such a strong pillar, like humans, we get together over food and drink. And is there anything better than that to like celebrate these values and this ethos you have and how everyone in the supply chain can like do their bit to give back to the community to help protect this planet build a better world and i think yeah you do such a good job of looking at that from every angle here it's really really cool yeah, yeah. thank you thank and you one thing i do want to touch on is of course the toilets <laughs> i love a bathroom and yours were top notch those like dark walls the, the sort of sink station in the middle and i know you were one of the first uh, spaces to actually be gender neutral <laughs> well yeah i mean it's, it's a big claim but i um i think when when we were sort of designing the space i knew that i wanted to um you know, have a gender neutral toilet. Mm -hmm. And partly because I'm really passionate about this. But um <laughs> but I, I hate that there's always a key for the women's and not for the men's. I Don't think that's like unfair. Um and um but I also think that, you know, obviously where we're now with, with understanding gender and our experiences of that, mm -hmm. we need it just to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And um and Kindred's core ethos is about making everyone feel welcome making everyone feel warm and wanted mm. and um the toilets even though people don't like to think about it i actually think there's nothing 
more important than just like knowing where you can pee yeah. um, <laughs> and knowing that that's okay and so that's very yeah it's important to us and I will say that even though when we have like you know 200 person events we never have a queue mm-hmm. for anyone which yeah. is great I love that and also now the boys don't have to miss out on all the toilet chat lucky, <laughs> lucky them <laughs> it's actually nice it's a weirdly nice moment when you kind of go down there and you see people gathering and chatting like yeah. men women like everybody and um, and everyone washes their hands which is also a great thing because there's Hallelujah. accountability there yeah. <laughs> cleanliness and hygiene you and I love it and socialization is yeah. the perfect triad well let's talk about the next chapter then um I know you've got some exciting things in store and I'd love to hear a bit about what's on the yeah on the cards for kindred yeah so um I mean like I say our cultural program is a really important part of kindred um and there are a few kind of key things in the calendar that we're excited about um next year so obviously I mean Christmas is sort of up ahead that's a very busy time for yeah. us um we're very very excited about that um but uh you know in March for example we have uh, we're going to celebrate International Women's Day um with a week-long uh, series of I mean, events around around you know highlighting some amazing women and what they're doing in the world and um and their work um and just sort of you know trying to foster more connections around that um and then june we're um doing uh our togetherness fest which we did this last year um just gone and it went really well and it falls in line with loneliness awareness week which is obviously something we're very passionate about um and it's a program a week-long program of events that are designed to bring everyone together so you know you have your we're going to do an id8 uh, event just for that um big parties supper clubs um workshops coffee mornings all sorts of things but lots of things to just yeah try and try and talk about loneliness and address it but but actually be proactive and create connections for people oh i think it's so special and i really honestly believe that spaces like this will be the change makers and we'll get this new wave of people coming together and discussing things that wouldn't happen even if even like five years pre-COVID, really. So I think it's super exciting what you guys are doing. Um, Thank you. And yeah, <laughs> exciting stuff ahead, I'm sure. Now, before we do go, I do have a game of Dream Spaces to play with you. Um, I'm going to ask you three prompts. Each one, imagine you've won the lottery, you cash that check, and you just get to pick the space of your dreams. Um, That's so perfect. Good. So the first one, where are you running away to to disconnect and detox? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I'm a, I'm an English home bird. I love the English countryside. So I think I love living in London, but I grew up in Somerset. So I think you know, mm-hmm. if money's no object, I would you know book out an amazing big house with a beautiful oh, lake and like just be in nature. That would be that would that would feed my soul a lot. I actually love Somerset. Yeah, I have a couple <laughs> of Somerset spritzes, as my friend from Somerset said, aka a cider. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. I recommend. This one's slightly different. Your ultimate birthday party where are you hosting it okay and money's no object on this one no money is <laughs> any object at all. okay good um so yeah i think yeah i think possibly like thai island um yeah. amazing food like just like 20 friends and you know beach and sunset and big villa big villa <laughs> go to a party oh yeah exactly <laughs> have you been to thailand before or? i did go once yeah oh. and it was just like, magic so yeah, yeah just just recreating that really <laughs> that sounds great enjoy um and finally your once in a lifetime bucket list trip where are you going and are you staying anywhere special Mm. Yeah, I've always wanted to explore the African continent more. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely, every time I've been, I've been to a few different countries, but I've always, um, yeah, I've always loved it. And I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would love to do like a longer sort of more immersive trip mm. and backpack and stop off at places in different countries and just really kind oh. of immerse myself. So that would be, that would be the dream. Love that. Any particular countries <laughs> top of your list? Or? Um, so Rwanda, actually, mm. um, I, yeah, niche. I know, but I think because they've got such an incredible history um, and they've come through so much. But I hear there's like an incredible art community yeah. there and a lot of sort of, um, yeah, entrepreneurs and there's a real like appetite there. And I just, um, I would love to sort of go and immerse myself. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I hope you get your trip around <laughs> Africa. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been such a pleasure chatting and hearing about this brilliant space. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Curated Spaces podcast. For more information and content around any of the spaces we feature, head to our website or Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to have new episodes delivered straight to your inbox every Wednesday. 
And if there's a special place in your life that you'd like to hear on the Curator Spaces podcast, please do get in touch as we're always on the lookout for more brilliant spaces to share with the world.